Welcome everybody to my plenary talk, Wireless Communications of the Future. And many thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to present our work here in Bratislava. My name is Markus Rupp. Uh, the presentation is mostly focusing on work of my PhD student Bashar Tahir, and therefore his name is also on the slide here. Furthermore, you see a lot of logos uh, in the bottom of the slide, uh, to which I will come later in my presentation. Before the corona pandemic started, other topics were often filling the news. One of them was autonomous driving, often associated with the cars from Tesla or the experiments by Google research. However, there's also other fields of autonomous movements. One important one is, is in Industry 4.0, where robots find their own path in an assembly hall, for example. The autonomous driving cars, or driving of the cars, on the other hand, is even more challenging, as typically these cars transport human beings, and we have to ensure safe driving. Both applications have in common that they require a continuous uh, communication with neighbors as well as a coordinating station. Thus, a large bandwidth is needed with very harsh conditions on low latency. How can this be done? Here's a typical scenario. Uh, the picture reflects well. Uh, what we have today in larger cities, many cars are going in the same direction, all controlled by human beings. In an autonomous scenario, these human beings could now do something else, while the car controllers could assure a much denser packing and at the same time less pollution and uh, less accidents. Well, due to safety reasons, this can only work if cars are communicating with each other. Classically, we have a communication link from each car to a nearby base station, but to control the cars among each other via the base station is not a very smart idea. First of all, it is challenging due to the low timing constraints that we have when the cars exchange actual localization information. And further, the additional data load over the base station would be substantial. It thus would make sense to have an additional car-to-car -car link that supports the control of the cars, while the base station only informs cars about long-term movements, such as upcoming road hazards or traffic light information. Also note that a car that is in the shadow of a building like this one here, hope you see my pointer, um, uh, like this one, uh, would not receive anything from the base station. But through the V2V communication, the wireless, uh, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication link, it can be informed about the approaching cars and thus take precautions before going further. What kind of a structure do we have here? Well, we have either a classical centralized network that is based on the base station that uh, is sharing information with UEs, or we have an ad hoc network supporting the car-to-car -car link. But as we do not like to add additional bandwidth, we simply do not want to have both of them uh, for separate bandwidth, but we want to consider a hybrid network using the same frequency band as before for both of these scenarios. How is this possible? Well, by so-called NOMA techniques, non-orthogonal multiple access techniques, we can provide this. Before I go to NOMA, let me quickly review the classical, which is called OMA, or orthogonal multiple access. This is the technique we are currently using in the fourth generation and also in the fifth generation. Here in this example, we have two users, UE1 and UE2, 
they are assigned to a certain, with a certain amount of frequency resources. As we can see here, the red part is for UE1, the blue part for UE2. UE1 receives both parts, but discards the second part. It's not interested in UE2, so it just takes UE1. Uh, the same is happening with UE2. Here we have um, only the part of UE2 and we discard UE1, so we are not using it. In a new NOMA system, things are different. Here all the frequency resources are shared by the users. They differentiate, however, in power. So they are using the entire bandwidth resources for both users. As user UE2 is far out, he must receive a larger power before this could be accommodated by a higher coding rate or more subcarriers. Now, UE2 receives a large signal for him interfered by a small signal for UE1. He thus treats this as an interference and detects only his own part. UE1, on the other hand, detects first the signal for UE2, as it is much larger than its own. Then he subtracts this signal from the original received signal, and all what remains is his own signal, which he then detects. Such a receiver we call successive interference counselor. Alternatively, there's also parallel interference counselors about which we will talk later. For the moment, a simple successive interference counselor is sufficient. <coughs> Note that this scheme only works because the power levels of UE1 and UE2 are significantly different. If they had roughly the same power, it would not work. Well, what are we doing? Exactly, the transmitter in the base station uh, has a relatively simple task here as it only needs to superimpose a small signal onto a large signal. We recognize now the virtual four-quam of the strong signal around which the small four-quam signals of the low power signals are. And here we have the four-quam constellation of the strong signal and here this small one is for the small signal. In 3GPP, this power NOMA system is already established, particularly under the name MUST. It, it means multi-user superposition transmission. And it was re, um, established in release 13 and 14 now. There's also other forms of NOMA, for example, code NOMA which may be even more efficient, but this is not supported yet in 3GPP. We will see a code NOMA example later. 3GPP supports power NOMA with three different power ratios, as you can see here in the table. Let me give you the same example as before, now for NOMA. We extend this to a third UE, the third one being far out. While classical LTE, the corresponding throughput curves are obtained, and um, that means the um, user UE1 uh, in an OMA system has the most throughput, then UE2, and finally UE3. We transmit here with the same transmit power for all three of them, and therefore, those that are further out have less throughput, and those that are closer to the base station have a higher throughput. Now we go to a NOMA system. We keep UE1 as it was, but we now share the resources of UE2 and UE3 for NOMA. The throughput of UE2 now substantially increases if the transmit power is large enough. You see that here. 
we can even achieve the same throughput as we have for UE1, which is even closer to the base station. However, this comes with uh, some drawback for UE3. The reason for this, and you see here a little bit less throughput, the reason for this is that only 4QAM is supported in LTE for this mode of operation. Nevertheless, the gain for UE2 can be much larger than the loss for UE3. At 5 dBm power, for example, here, the transmit power you, uh, for UE3 does not show any loss, but UE2 has a good gain at this point. Where am I? My cursor on. Ah, here it is. So we were at 5 dBm. Here you see UE3 has about the same quality, but here at 5 dBm, UE2 has already substantial gain. Now we would like to know what is the gain overall, and um, that we see here in this figure where I plot the sum throughput over all three users. Uh, since user one, UE1, was not affected, it remains the same. But uh, the other two exchange uh, gains and losses. And here we see that uh, after 0 dBm transmit power, we have already gains in the sum throughput. So with NOMA techniques, we can transmit more than before with the classical OMA scheme. If you are interested in this, there's uh, some literature here on the bottom. Well, we can do more with NOMA techniques. Let us move now to a more complex scenario. Many UEs like to tell the base station something all at the same time. This could be cars, but also in general, any IoT device could be a UE. In this uplink case with classic OMA, LTE, all UEs must first get a channel assigned, which costs a lot of overhead through signaling. Such a method would thus be very ineffective. Let's see how we can do better. With NOMA, we could pack all UEs that are originating from these IoT devices in one band and allow them to directly communicate with the base station. This frees a lot of resources for other users now. Such a scheme is called a grant free access scheme as signaling beforehand is not required. Now the NOMA signals are not differing by power, but they all use different signature codes. Therefore, this is a code NOMA system. The only question that remains now is, how can the base station detect all these signals on top of each other? Obviously, we need signature codes now to distinguish the various IoT devices. Each IoT device has its own signature. As there are billions of devices, we need lots of signatures. If all such signatures would be perfectly orthogonal, they would be very long. And if the number increases, we would run out of signatures with a fixed length. To overcome this, we do not look for signatures that are perfectly orthogonal, but only have a low cross correlation, low enough so that we can distinguish such, such sequences with easy detectors. The idea is to describe the signatures for a given length n on an n-dimensional hypersphere and maximize any two adjacent points on such hypersphere. By this, the correlation of the sequences is minimized. If you are interested more in the details how to find these points, you can read it up here in this literature. If each user K, let's call it, we have capital K users, if each user transmits its signal XK by a coded signature, let's call that SK, then the transmission is a convolution of such signatures 
with the channel H. If we furthermore assume that each of the UEs transmit with its individual power PK, then we can describe the received signal Y as to as a so-called Katri Rao product of the channel H with the signatures S. We also add Gaussian noise at the receiver end. The final product, including the power, let's call this matrix B here on the bottom. We will see that on the next slide. Now we have a very simple model with this matrix B that contains all the channel, the signatures, and the different powers that we are transmitting with. This makes it a very compact description, and we can try several detectors. For example, a matched filter would be of lowest complexity. A so-called minimum mean square error filter, on the other hand, results in smallest error energy and thus largest signal to interference and noise ratio. We consider a parallel interference counselor as iterative decoder allowing to decode all IoT devices at the same time. We can see here in the figure we have an iterative scheme. Where is my cursor again? Ah, here. This is an iterative scheme where we go first through a first simple detector, then we decode, and then with that information we go back again into the scheme for several times. In this figure, we compare the performance results of various NOMA schemes to the original OMA scheme. Note that this is not a fair comparison, as in OMA, we have substantially less users than in NOMA. We recognize that the lowest complexity, that is a matched filter, this is the curve out here, um, that uh, this provides only a moderate detection quality. But once we use a minimum mean square receiver, which costs a bit more on complexity, with parallel interference cancellation, after six iterations of this scheme, we are basically as good as OMA, but now, uh, we are down there at the red line, but now with substantially more users. So we do a lot better than before. Different to before, the number of users is a priori unknown. We do not know how many IoT devices we have. Therefore, we cannot design these codes beforehand. The only feasible approach now is to use random code as signature and um, that and hope that they exhibit a sufficiently low cross-correlation. With some probability, some of these random codes will be very close to each other and do not have enough low cross-correlation. But mostly, uh, they will. How can we do this? Our approach here is very simple. We use the entire time frequency grid that is uh, offered by OFDM in, in LTE. Uh, for the IoT devices and generate random codes. Here we see an illustrative example when three codes are superimposed. At the end, it's not easy to detect which one was being used originally. Yeah? You see superposition of all these codes, and there may not be only three, there may be hundreds of them. We detect here by a very simple detection scheme as shown in the upper equation. In this example, uh, we use 16 IoT devices and uh, we simply compute this value Ti and compare it with the threshold. And if uh, all of the patterns that we select have sufficiently low correlation, the outcome may look like this. Here you see one, two, three, four very strong signals. So obviously uh, we had four patterns, the patterns numbers one, six, eleven, 
and 12. And uh, the remaining ones occur, uh, appear to be very small. So this is relatively easy to detect. But in some other situations, it's not so easy. Here, for example, it looks as if we have only three of them, although we transmitted four. One of them, number 14, is hardly visible, and there would be some, like number 12, that is even a little bit larger. So in some scenarios, we do not detect all. One idea to improve this detection scheme is to use a neural network. As you all know, deep neural networks are a big hype these days. At the annual ICAS conference, uh, which is uh, held in two weeks in Barcelona, also virtual as this one, uh, where usually all the signal processing people meet from the world, more than 50% of the papers are related to neural networks. So we decided to give it also a try. Of course, you have to train the network first, but this is easy as you only need to generate the random code patterns and feed the information to the network for training. After a couple of thousand training runs, the network is ready for detection. Here's the setup that we are using. We try to make it very realistic at 5.9 gigahertz, where car to car communication would take place. The channel exhibits an RMS delay spread of 100 nanosecond with a velocity of the cars of 50 kilometers. Very common and is as if cars are going along a street in the city. We used four hidden layers and stayed with our example of 16 patterns out of which we want to select four. And here is what comes out. If we use the very simple sensing scheme without a neural network, then um, it turns out that we have a um, correct detection probability of only 10%. Whether we know that there is four or we simply use the threshold and take the strongest one does not matter much for the obtained quality. For a neural network, however, the results are significantly better. Now we are obtaining about 96 to 97 percent of correct detection. For this, we needed 70,500 sets for training and 2,500 to validate. The algorithm was programmed by using MATLAB um, uh, machine learning toolbox. Very simple. In fact, just a few lines of code. Before I come to the end of my talk, I want to address other challenges in the context of wireless communications for the future. UMA is only one sport among many others that we are active in. For this reason, we founded a so-called Christian Doppler Laboratory with the support of four companies. You see here Austrian Air, um, Train, uh, Nokia, uh, A1, the service provider uh, of Austria, and uh, network architectures, Katrine, uh, that are well known for their antennas. Such labs are nicely supported by grants from the government and guarantee a lifetime of seven years. So the name of the lab is Christian Doppler Lab for Dependable Wireless Connectivity for the society in motion, dependable, because now in wireless scenarios, we have a uh, cornucopia of new services and they are very much dependent on each other and on the quality of the channels that we can provide. Society in motion, that is us, because uh, we more and more move into a society that lives in cities but is permanently moving around in city either by public transportation or uh, our own cars uh, but uh, we can only do that very efficiently uh, as long as we have good wireless connection
Many people are necessary for such a team. Mostly PhD students are involved in such a lab. They are the people who really bring ideas forward. The activities include also measurements and experimental work, but most of the effort these days is related to simulators in link and system level. Such simulators are a gigantic amount of code that cannot be completely tested anymore, and it requires many people to develop and maintain them. As we offer them freely to academic partners around the world, we have several thousand users that support us with feedback about the quality. Essentially, they test the code for us. This allows us then also to sell simulators with a proven quality to many 3GPP companies. I just want to give you a glimpse of what else we do as we are not only working on NOMA techniques. This picture here provides us a very good idea of other topics we are interested in. We work on millimeter wave technologies at 60 as well as on 28 gigahertz. Such millimeter wave signals cannot only be used to transmit information, but also work as radar providing localization information. The car in front of us, for example, this green one here, senses the pedestrian or the bicyclist here as a potential hazard. Small smart traffic lights, as we can see here, they have something on top. Uh, they are distributing information about cars in the neighborhood. For example, the truck here, the blue truck, is warned about this car that is invisible for him uh, since uh, it's blocked by uh, the big building on the corner. And at the same time, this car would be informed about approaching cars like uh, the blue van, uh, so that it knows it cannot simply go around the corner without stopping. Let me conclude my presentation. My strong belief is that in a certain time period, let's say 20 years from now, wireless communications will be very different from today due to very different demands. The early requests of two people talking to each other are not important anymore. Now machines are talking to each other and this calls for big changes in the way we consider wireless communication. While most issues are addressed, I did not talk about the problems that are even more important. These are security. If somebody hacks into such a system and controls your car or others, then this be could become a disaster. Therefore, the more we will become dependent on such autonomous systems, the more we need to put our energy and innovation into security and safety. What happens if some system does not work as expected. Let's say a base station falls out may, maybe because of an attack, but simply maybe because it's out of power. Then we need decentralized fallback modes. The cars still need to keep going, maybe not as fast as before, but certainly as secure as before. Let's start work on such issues because they are very important. Thank you all for listening. I will be around for a while to answer your questions. In case you are not lucky to get your question answered directly, please write to me. Here's my email address. All slides will also be available to you. At the end of the slides, I show you in a moment, you will find a list with literature from us that you may study if some of the topics are of more interest for you. For example, it starts with overview literature, and you can see here in blue all kind of links where you just click on, and then you are either directed uh, immediately to IEEE Explorer to download the original paper, or to our base database in Vienna where you can upload the papers from.
there's many uh, different kind of papers, not only overview papers, but particular papers on high-speed systems when you want to design um, transmission systems that uh, work with uh, high-moving objects like high-speed trains. And uh, you know, as you can see, there's many literature uh, on this, uh, particular when you move in the direction of 5G. Uh, we developed many new schemes for this. And um, there is measurements, uh, mostly on 60 gigahertz channel um, experiments. Also, lots about heterogeneous networks and random objects that are involved with that. And uh, particular uh, results on trains, a lot of experiments that we do with Austrian and German trains. And uh, finally, some uh, MIMO schemes, LTE advanced full dimension MIMO schemes, where you uh, include three dimensional channel models, uh, which is called full dimension MIMO, as you can see here. And uh, particularly 60 gigahertz links measurements. And finally, uh, some topics about NOMA, what I presented today, and coding, uh, so that you can find all the topics that I discussed today uh, also directly. Now, thank you for your interest, and I would be ready to answer some questions. Many thanks, Markus, for your talk. I have maybe, uh, now is the uh, discussion open for questions. Please drop your question to Q&A. And maybe I have one question. How yes. much, what is your opinion? How much are going to change uh, mobile communication neural network and artificial in intelligence in general? Uh, yes, well, what is the question? Uh, the question is, uh, what is the, how much will influence the neural uh, networks? Yeah, model? well, we see neural networks, in particular deep neural networks, coming up as a hot topic now in, in communications. Uh, well, it has been around in signal processing for many different applications, but not so much in, in, in mobile communications. But uh, what we see is that, um, uh, particular in optimizing problems like optimizing the network, here um, neural networks seem to be quite useful. Um, on the physical layer, we have not seen too many activities, but maybe it just starts. Many thanks. Maybe I will give now uh, words to Yuan. Uh, do you have any question to this discussion? Any input? Uh, there was a wonderful presentation, so thank you. And uh, maybe a question, uh, Marcus, to you uh, concerning IoT. Uh, we know that um, there is drawback in uh, 2G and 3G with a lot of devices uh, communicate, communicating uh, on low speed. So how the OMA and uh, NOMA is uh, solving this problem? Uh, is this uh, already solved in a um, satisfying manner? in, uh, let's say, 5G and future communication? Um, now, in, in 5G is only power noma the, um, specified, as I showed. Uh, what we would need is code noma in order to support an infinite number of possible IoT devices. Um, so this is um, part of the uh, discussions right now in, in 3GPP. I, I have no idea. Um, when they will define something in, as a release. Okay, thank you. And uh, hopefully, uh, I'm not really the fan of uh, self-driving vehicles because I consider it as a big threat to security, uh, but I'm keen on uh, new development in the area of uh, mobile communication. So thank you once more. And I will let the floor uh, to the questions. There, are, there is a lot of questions. I see some questions on the chat. M maybe I, I can read them and answer them. Is, is that the procedure? It's your 
you are please go ahead yeah okay well there's a question regarding security what are in your opinion the biggest security threats to be considered in 5g networks when talking about the iot environment um uh, this is um particularly um well let, let's say um with with iot you have a lot of sensors essentially around and you could fake of course the sensor signals uh, you could also suppress them which could be even worse because uh, if you intentionally put, uh, for example lay a fire somewhere and then suppress the sensor data uh, then um, the, the fire tracks uh, would not be informed for example so you can imagine a lot of possibilities to really um, um, be a um, um, security or safety threat for for human beings in in urban scenarios where everything is more or less controlled wirelessly uh, on on modern wireless networks it doesn't need to be 5g there may be uh, the next ones for that um, essentially uh, the the issue here is to um, to ensure the security and this is uh, certainly not very easy um, we have mostly these days um, security means that are quite well working for point-to-point -point connections uh, however uh, there is many issues um, or means that you can uh, suppress signals or fake signals uh, that is very difficult to detect so uh, here uh, we need even more security means maybe also some that are um, overlooking scenarios that can figure out that uh, some information that comes um, maybe some warnings may not be correct because they are fake yeah. uh, what could help here is in the future that um, the wireless systems are intended also to provide localization information that means we would know pretty much from where this information comes from uh, and uh, that not a fake uh, iot device claims uh, it is let's say in the middle of bratislava but in fact it's in some different country okay um let me move to another question how does this technology affect the strain on current network infrastructure will there be the need to rebuild some parts of the infrastructure to accommodate this maybe in smaller cities or in countries with worse network coverage um, what we expect here is, is a stronger and stronger urbanization uh, the uh, UN forecasts that in, in 2050 about 87 percent of the people uh, on on the earth will live in larger cities therefore we concentrate on cities and they continuously um, build out their infrastructure so in a way this is going to happen already it's not just fiber that is laid uh, everywhere uh, but also um, um, there's a lot of uh, different infrastructure nowadays if, if you build streets and so on um, so we, we can expect a lot to happen there in, in the next years okay there is a question from security point of view there's a challenge of detecting a civil attack in V2V communications where a malicious node is creating multiple false identities by broadcasting messages that appear to originate from different virtual non-existing nodes. It may also alter its transmit power to make detection based on receiving signal strength difficult. Is there a possibility to detect unexpected transmit power changes by UE in NOMA? Um, well, from the top of my head, I I don't know, but I, I have not never thought about it. Uh, so, um, uh, well, the answer is no. I don't I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't mean uh, that there is no no means. Uh, yeah. With the increased number of antennas per device in multi-user MIMO systems, do you see neural network enhancements? as the only way to manage this is increase of antennas 
Uh, no, no. Uh, this, this, uh, at the moment, we are still looking in many other directions and not just neural networks because uh, neural networks need training and if you change the environment, you may have to retrain again. So uh, this is certainly not uh, the right way to go. We want to ensure that uh, if we have a huge, a huge amount of uh, antennas, that we uh, use them properly and not uh, that uh, for a while uh, they depend on a neural network that may not have learned correctly. Uh, so um, I, I see neural networks here as a potential for the future, but uh, there is not so far to my knowledge, not a, a clear answer that they would improve the scenario. Uh, here I have a, another question that says, what will be the trend in using security mechanisms taking into account small computing power of IoT modules? Um, a, a trend in security? Um, I, I cannot answer. I'm not an expert in security. So, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Markus, uh, for answering uh, these questions. Uh, the, it's uh, from our colleagues, the question related to security due to their experts in the security area. So they immediately have uh, uh, ideas how to hack it or how to improve the security. So therefore, they, you have so many questions related to security. Uh, but I, I mean, I have some people that work on security and uh, if, if you're interested in that, I can make a connection to them. That's, that's very nice, thanks. And uh, you mentioned shortly that uh, the hybrid approach is uh, currently the most uh, realistic. So what is your opinion? How much will stay centralized and uh, here, here organization from point of management of the mobile communication? And what makes definitely sense to leave hybrid, uh, decentralized? Well, the, the decentralized part is the local information that cars inform about their position and speed to their neighbor cars. So here the, um, uh, the reach is very short, maybe five meters or even less, maybe only two meters are sufficient because you do not want to overwhelm all the neighbor cars with, with your information if uh, it's not necessary. Um, I mean, the, the good uh, concept here is that we do not need to change much as we have already an existing 4G or 5G system uh, running everywhere. Uh, there's, of course, alternatives. Uh, there is an um, uh, 802.11p uh, proposal, uh, which is completely on ad hoc systems, but that would need to be installed everywhere first. And um, uh, it's not clear whether this is um, better at all on the, on the one hand, but certainly it will be more expensive since it's not around yet. Uh, so uh, it's probably making sense to base everything on 3GPP, um, 4G, 5G, and, and, and the next Gs that are coming up, uh, as you have already the infrastructure. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe I'm curious, I know that your team was doing the measurement in high-speed train. How is, uh, how is uh, running this research? Because it was very interesting. Your Sorry, team, what's the question? Your team was doing the measurement in the high-speed train. Yes. Was running this research because it was in this time it was very interesting and you have very nice uh, result. Yes, thank you. Do you want me to comment? Is it, still, is it still running? Oh yeah, yeah. There's more and more demands on this. the The issue is is quite um, well. Let's say it's it's easy to understand what the problem is. The the wagons of of the trains are more or less isolately isolated, completely isolated, also from electromagnetic waves. The reason for that is that um, the glass windows are uh, furbished with uh, some um, uh, electro uh, with some um, um, electric uh, wires, uh, very fine wires essentially, uh, because they um, assure that the heat is not going out, so they can control better the air condition in, in the train. 
but at the same time, they're also not allowing to um, enter the electromagnetic waves from outside. So therefore, trains are typically quite isolated in, in terms of electromagnetic waves. Um, nevertheless, a little bit uh, passes through the windows, otherwise you could not uh, work your cell phone at all in the train. Uh, and um, the train providers uh, had the, the idea to use repeaters where they capture the signal on the top of the wagon and then by a repeater distribute it into the wagon. Uh, this for uh, itself is probably a good idea, but um, unfortunately the windows are still there and that means now you have two signals that you receive, one from the repeater and one through the window. And the one through the repeater is delayed because of the repeater. Uh, that means uh, the same signal uh, you receive twice uh, and one is so much delayed that uh, the cell phone cannot distinguish between the two and then uh, the the quality that they see their own signal as interference signal and the quality of the reception is uh, therefore decreased and that is the reason that the first try of the um, the train operators to use um, repeaters didn't work out and they spend a lot of money in improving the quality but in fact they made it worse and now by uh, looking uh, more in the details of this and arranging the base stations along the uh, the tracks uh, more carefully, we, subst uh, we, we uh, uh, incrementally improve um, the tracks uh, step by step. So they get better and better now. Thank you for your answers. I maybe I don't see the additional. Uh, Michael, maybe. Uh, there are not scientific questions, but uh, maybe as uh, we are here, we can answer some questions also regarding uh, current situation. Because in Slovakia there was discussion concerning Corona that uh, we can uh, follow the people or uh, check what people are doing and where they are going. And to create a map who is uh, with who and then uh, to uh, send sms uh, pay attention this uh, this uh, guy is uh, corona positive and you may be also so uh, do you have any comments on this because personally i don't think it can work with mobile signal but uh, it's up to you as an expert in the field so, technically speaking uh, you can detect probably people um, in the range of two three meters so uh, roughly, yes, uh, technically this could work, but uh, I wonder if uh, uh, there is uh, some privacy issues with that. I mean, uh, we are also not uh, distributing information about uh, people that were in jail before or uh, were known to do anything uh, that uh, is illegal. Uh, now uh, we, we start with something uh, that uh, um, it's uh, more or less a private issue. Uh, so uh, uh, I think legally uh, we should not think about these things. And uh, maybe uh, more for uh, fun, you have heard that uh, in certain counties uh, there was attacks to 5G uh, transmitters and antennas because they are helping to distribute uh, coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, people believe that uh, wireless communication is always a threat of uh, uh, the worst in the world, and uh, there is uh, many medical doctors. They um, uh, proclamate that uh, uh, you should not use a cell phone, although they cannot live without it. Um, uh, I can only uh, direct here to the World uh, Health Organization, uh, who uh, came to the conclusion that using your cell phone is as dangerous as drinking a cup of coffee. <laughs> So don't drink a coffee, you mean. <laughs> okay, thank you from my side. Uh, it was a very nice presentation and uh, I give over to Mikhail.